I'll try not to get too excited this morning. This is like the dream of the mission pastor. We're finally on the mission series. Come on, guys. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, I know. It's super exciting, but this morning we want to, we're really just beginning and we're going to set kind of some framework and foundations around mission. You know, Mark has expressed we've kind of been in this poignant moment where God has been asking us to give fresh attention to what he might be leading to us in as we look at our reach vision and the vision that he's given us to steward. And, And it's been my joy to kind of have the space to sit and listen to you guys to think about the cultural moment we're in, the the global church moment that we're in, to walk with the Lord and listen to him. And and, um, and yeah, it's been a real privilege, I think, to, to, to have that space to do that. And I'm super excited at what is bubbling in our midst and where he is leading us. Um, and he's leading us into good things. It's going to be a good journey for us here as Verso. But, you know, it's really easy to jump into the what of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and all of that good stuff. But I don't know about you, but it's absolutely foundational that we understand the why of mission. And if we don't get this bit, none of the rest of it will, be, um, will make sense and we will burn out quickly. Um, and, and I think a good missions talk often starts with the Great Commission. <laughs> Don't worry, it's going to feature. Um, But I want us to zoom out a little bit and I want us to think about what is it, why do we do mission? And I love this picture in Revelation 7, 9. I'm just going to read this scripture for us. And after I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every single nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and all around the elders and all the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And can I tell you a secret that Adam and I did not talk about worship today? (laughs) I sat in worship and I was like, Jesus, you're so good. This song is, we've done that this morning. We stood in this place and we just said all honor and glory and worthy is to the lamb on the throne forever and ever. But what I love in this picture, and it's the, it's the crucial picture for me of missions, is that every person from every nation, like every person, not every person, all people that represent all nations, tribes, people groups, and tongues will one day get round that throne and worship the Father. And this is really important for us to understand because this highlights and reminds us that mission is not something that we create. It's not a program that we do. It's not a team that we sign up to. It's God's story. It's our story in every moment of our lives because we've said yes to him. And his story started in a garden that was where people were created in his image to commune with him, to walk in the cool of the day. That was what we were created for. And we know how the story goes, right? Then we decided that we knew better than God and and brokenness entered the world. But God in his kindness came and he sent Jesus so that we could be part of a restoration story to what end? To a new heaven and a new earth where all nations from people from all tribes, tongues and languages worship once again, restored to their original design as it was meant to be. This is the story of mission. This is what mission is. Mission for the church is about his people stepping into his story, of doing what we were intended to do in the first place, one of partnering with him in restoring this world from back to how he intended it and created it to be. And the theologian Christopher Wright says this, it is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, is that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church, 
The church was made for mission, God's mission. And this picture here in Revelation 7, 9, it starts to shape our thinking and it needs to drive us in how we go about mission. And there's been this budding question that I've been asked so many times in the last few months as I've talked to different people in Verso. And so many of them says, you know what, Claire, I, lo- I, love, I love that you love the nations. I love that you love all this stuff. Um, but, you know, I mean, we've got nations here and, and, and we've got so much need on our doorstep. Why would we need to go further afield? And I want us to see something that we've, we see in this, in this picture in Revelation 7, 9. And that is God made every person in this world from all the different nations, all the different tribes, all the different languages in his image. Therefore, for us to understand God fully, we have to engage with all people, all nations, all tribes. There is something in the nations that expresses who God is that when we don't engage in the nations, we miss something of who he is. And it also highlights to us that we don't just go out into the world with the answer to serve and to give. That is part of it. But we go to learn and to grow. And there's something for us as Verso in this season that we need to expand our reach. We need to get out of this building. We need to go out of the borders of the UK, into Europe, across Asia, across to the ends of the world. Why? Because we want to grow in our love of Jesus and who he is. And we want to become more like him. And we will do that as we engage with the full expression of who he is. a little why. (laughs) And so then God, in his kindness, right, he then gives us this great commission. And I'm not going to go into it this morning because you can go back to when I preached back in November. Um, I did a a, a talk in the call series uh, on Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And I'm just going to quickly remind us that in that talk, I talked to us about how God in the great commission, he calls us to himself first because before the go into all the nations, he says they came and they worshipped him. Mission starts in worship and encountering the presence of God. And then out of that place, we are commissioned to go into the world. And then Jesus, I mean, the Father says in his kindness that he will go with us. He will stay with us. He will give him, he will be with us to the very end of the age, right? He promises his spirit to us. And so we know that. And we, I'm not going to dive into Matthew 28 this morning, but he has given us the what of mission. We are to go into the nations. And we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are to teach them to obey everything that he has commanded us. And we do that with the promise of his spirit that he will go with us wherever we go, which is amazing. But I want to dive in now in these last few minutes here of, okay, but how? Like, and I was asking the Lord, this is all great stuff. We know this. The church knows this. They know they need to go make disciples. Come on, Jesus. Like, <laughs> we need a bit more to this. Um, and, I was, and I was thinking, oh, I need, a, I need an idea. How are we going to strategically do this for a church of our size? And, and I felt a real sharpening, actually, of the Holy Spirit. And, and he said to me, Claire, I don't want you to come up with a good idea. I want you to go back to my Bible. <laughs> And I want you to find the biblical framework for mission, and it's simple, and it's not a snazzy idea. It comes straight out of the Bible, because guess what? God already gave us the strategic plan for how to reach the world and reach the nations. And so I want us to turn right now to Acts 1.8, and it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, this scripture for context is essentially some of the last words that Jesus gives to his disciples before he ascends into heaven. That means pay attention, right? You give your last final remit to someone when you're leaving them. You give them the most important information. And they've been asking him about when the time, when the end will come. And he tells them that no one can know the end. But then he points out that he's giving them a gift and a responsibility to run with. And so it says there, doesn't it, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, interestingly, this word power, when I looked at it, means dunamis power. And if you've been around Verso for a while, you will remember a few months ago that Mark unpacked the dunamis power of God at work in our lives. 
right? That dynamite power coming alive. And what it reminds us, if you think back to that series, is that Mark was calling out of us that we need to start acting like God is who he says he is and that we really are who we say he says we are, right? That was a a recalibration of understanding our identity in Christ. And this power that comes to us when we receive the Holy Spirit reminds us that it's not based on our ability. Mission is not our ability. It is about the the receiving of the gift of God in our lives. And it's his gift in us that will empower us to walk out what he's called us to do. And it also reminds us that missions is not about striving for more activity. You will be glad to know. I am not going to be begging you to sign up to Rotas. Hallelujah. (laughs) But this spirit of God that he's given here is about walking and staying in step with the Lord. We in this season are going to be committed to hearing his voice, to pursuing his presence, because in his presence, we worship him, we keep in line with him, we're sharpened by him, we hear his voice, we learn when he's opening a door and when he's saying no, we learn to cultivate simple obedience. And it's stepping into the mission of God comes alive in us when we recognize this gift of God that he's given to us, right? When we are consumed by the radical transformation of the undeserving, abundant love of Jesus that has radically changed my life. When we are consumed by that love, we are activated. We can't help but tell the people around us about the good news of Jesus. Not that he simply came to clean up my sin, but he intended me to live in that garden. And he intends me to live forever in a place of communion, of joy, of peace, where there is no racial tension anymore, where there is no polarization anymore, because we are one in Jesus, where we are standing in worship before him. And so the good news is, if you don't feel like you can step into doing more mission, or even being evangelistic in any way. Don't worry, you don't have to on your own. Pursue Jesus, worship him, and watch what the power of his spirit in your life will do. You know, I was thinking even about, uh, even just a funny story to demonstrate that. Just, you know, I think we sometimes, we feel like, how can I, I, I don't know, I feel like if, you, if you've listened to me talk a lot around here, you will know I've told many stories of how I failed at telling people about Jesus. You know, just in my last talk at the beginning of the summer about walking up to people in Harperdon and being, you know, let, the honest version of Claire Mulrooney and, and the fear that enters my heart sometimes when I want to tell people about Jesus. But I have also witnessed when we give our simple yes to Jesus, his power to do the things that we could never do on our own. And I was reminded this morning as I was driving in of my 19-year-old self as I said yes to Jesus and I went to the Amazon jungle and I trekked with my outreach team to some unreached people in tribes that had never heard of Jesus. And I was like way too big for my boots at 19 and really needed to be knocked down a peg or two. And, uh, and, but quite frankly, I was ill-equipped to ever enter a tribal people to tell them about Jesus. Like, what what was I thinking? But here I was with this team giving my yes to Jesus. And I remember we walked into this tribe. We were about six days into a trek deep in the jungle. We walked into this tribe that had never heard of Jesus before. And we stood before this group and we and we basically didn't our translator disappeared somewhere. And um and I was like standing before this lady and she started to cry and we started to, I was like, what are we supposed to do? Let's just pray for her. You know, like we're all trying to work it out. And, um, and out of nowhere, God gave me the language to speak her language. And I didn't even know what was happening. It was like an out, outward, like outer body experience. And I sat in this tiny Amazonian tribal community And with my teammate, we led this lady to Jesus. And we were literally speaking her language. And and it was just for the moment that we were there. Guys, that was not anything I did. 
that was a desperate 19 year old needing the power of God. And why? Because Jesus wanted to lead that lady to Jesus. And now the gospel is spreading like wildfire through the Amazon, right? And that's just simple obedience. And that's the same whether we walk in the street of St. Albans, whether we walk into a tribal community in the middle of Timbuktu, the power of God is not dependent on you and me, it's about saying yes to Jesus. Moving on here in Acts 1.8, it says, and you will be my witnesses. And here comes our responsibility. If we think about the word witness here, what is a witness? A witness is someone who has experienced something, they've seen something, they've been present to something, and then they have to tell or reenact or or kind of, um, yeah, retell a situation. And Jesus is saying to them that, you know, as the spirit falls on you, you will receive the gift of my power to be my witness, to witness boldly, to affirm the truth of the gospel, that as they have witnessed the presence and the power of Jesus in what they have been around, they now have to go and show and tell that to the world around them. But if you look at this original um, language here on the word witness, it comes from the word martis, which is also the word in English that we get martyr from. And there's a challenge in this for us, I think. I think some of us are really comfortable with being witnesses to Jesus when it's on our terms. But Jesus is speaking to these disciples and he's saying, you need to be my witness, no matter what the cost. It's a picture of someone who is willing to stand boldly for the truth and the good news of the gospel no matter what the cost. And interestingly, as I was studying this, I was reflecting back and realizing, did you know that 10 of the 12 disciples were martyrs? One of them died of old age. One of them, Judas, lost the plot and and essentially committed suicide. But there was something in these disciples that got the costliness sometimes. Now, I'm not suggesting that in this room we're all going to die for our faith, but I am acutely aware that we live in a cultural moment where the ability to stand boldly for the gospel is becoming more and more costly. Standing up for the gospel might cost you your integrity. Uh, Not cost you your integrity, but it might question, you might have to stand up against something for integrity of the gospel. It might cost you in being patient with a person that drives you crazy. To love the unlovable. To stand up for what's right when everybody else around you is laughing and gossiping. And okay with a joke that's not appropriate. There is a costliness to our discipleship and our witness for Jesus that means our yes costs something. But what I also love here is that I noticed that when the Spirit came upon them, it says, you shall be my witnesses. They're indicative, not imperative. Jesus didn't recommend that they become witnesses when they receive his presence and the Holy Spirit in their lives. He said when the Spirit was in them, they would be his witnesses. So as we pursue his presence, as we fall in love and become passionate followers of Jesus, the overflow will be that you are his witness. It's not striving and making it up. And so finally here, we see in the scripture, three distinctives of how they're gonna be witnesses. They're gonna go to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, in that time, geographically, Jerusalem would have been their real local area, their local setting, the streets that they walked on, the people that they were really comfortable being around. Relationally, relationally easy, culturally really similar. Judea in that time would have been the next kind of region out geographically, a bit further afield. It would have been familiar to them, but it would also have had bits that may, maybe they had to ask questions a little bit more about. Perhaps for us in that context, you know, if you think about our immediate family, we know them intimately, but our extended family, you know, I have extended family that live in the US, 
I love them, I know them, but every time I visit, there's some new thing that I'm like, ooh, that, ooh that's, that's a bit different. Um, it catches me off guard. Samaria. It was also in that further afield bit, but it was a place of tension and difficulty, a people that the Jews hated. And yet Jesus tells the disciples, I even want you to go to the people that you hate and tell them about me and what you have witnessed. And to the ends of the earth, far away, totally different, unknown, completely foreign, But what I love most about this here is that Jesus was blowing their minds. These disciples were asking Jesus about the kingdom of Israel, when the kingdom of Israel would be restored. But they were failing to grasp the size of the mission that he was talking about. He was talking about the kingdom across the world, the entire world. And they were to take the gospels to the ends of the earth. And verso, as we come in here to end, this is the challenge, I believe that God has for us in this season. We are not to think small. The enemy wants to convince the global church in this time that the darkness is too dark and that people's hearts are too hard and that it's gonna be impossible to see the Great Commission fulfilled in our lifetime. But as we invest in people, families, lives, communities, nations are transformed. We are to ask, verse so, for the nations as our inheritance, the ends of the earth as our possession. And I believe with all of my heart that if we pursue Jesus in his presence, we will see the Great Commission fulfilled in this lifetime. We are so close, we are so close, but God is calling us to gear shift our game of loving him passionately so that we can love the world around us 